Listeners, readers, welcome to the Foxed page, where we dive deep into the very best books. You'll come away with a richer understanding of the text at hand, all while learning to read everything a little better. I'm Kimberly Ford, one-time adjunct professor at Berkeley, best-selling author and PhD in Spanish and French literature. So the last part of that description, the PhD in Spanish and French literature, is a um, going to really come into play today. When I was in graduate school in the 90s, I loved graduate school so much. When I was there, the work of Isabel Allende was, um, you know, not taken as seriously as it might have been. Any one of you who listened to the earlier lecture on Cien Años de Soledad knows that very recently, for whatever reason, I was struck by the desire to listen to that book on Audible. And I just absolutely loved it. I mean, I think it was like 20 hours or something, but it was so soothing and so interesting and so engrossing in ways and, and just like delightful in a way that I didn't remember thinking it was back when I read it, you know, in, in the 90s. And then at some point, I don't know, a month later, all of a sudden I was wanting to get that feeling back. And I thought, I know, I'll go and listen to some Allende. And in fact, the one that seemed most interesting to me, and the one that I think is, is in fact her best book, having now read a lot of them, was the original novel that she wrote, the first, La Casa de los Espíritus. The House of the Spirits came out in Spain in 1982, in the United States in 1985. So I listened to it in Spanish on Audible, and in some ways, listening to these things in Spanish, it is honestly a real privilege because translating these books, as you can imagine, uh, presents some sort of challenges here and there. Also, it's just always a privilege to listen to something in its original language. But so I was listening to the Isabel Allende, and it's the most incredible version on audio on Audible. Um, it's mostly a woman who reads. It's mostly a female narrator. There are parts by Esteban Trueba, who is it's read by a man. But I was so kind of swept up in this family saga. The thing that became immediately apparent to me, though, which oddly had never struck me before, was the way in which La Casa de los Espíritus has so many echoes and in many ways is a conversation with Cien Años de Soledad. I mean, this seems so incredibly obvious now. And, you know, I think like at some point there was some debate about like whether or not this was piracy and whether or not this was like, you know, whether or not she was writing sort of too much in the style of Gabriel García Mar. Marquez, but it took me very little time to understand that, yes, she was echoing Gabriel García Márquez, but she was doing it in a way that was really in conversation and in many ways was a counterpoint or, or a corrective, really, to Cien Años de Soledad. So the idea of comparing the two of them was so interesting to me. And you should have seen me. I'd be out on my dog walks and there would be all of these parallels that would be popping up and I'd be like getting out my notes app on my phone and I have this long, long, long note in my phone about all of the parallels between them, which we will get to. Um, and some of the differences, certainly. But it was such a joy that I was dying to get in here and record this thing. For those of you who like an agenda, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about some of the basics of Marquez and Allende, a little bit about their backgrounds in their respective countries in South America, but also a little more specifically about the historical circumstances in which each was writing. And it's pretty shocking to me um, in some ways how similar and how volatile those times were. It's just, it, I mean, it's almost sort of irresponsible to read these books without having a tiny sense of the incredible political upheaval that colored the time in which these people were writing. We're then going to talk about uh, some of the parallels, some of the many parallels. We're going to kind of zip through those, mostly because it's just interesting to kind of list them all. We're then going to talk about magic realism. Obviously, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's Cien Años de Soledad is like the, um, you know, archetypal example and, and in many ways kind of the introduction of magic realism. And Allende certainly, you know, continues in that vein. And, and in many ways, they're using this kind of style, this genre of writing in the same ways. And in some ways, there are some departures that we will look at. We're then going to look more closely at Casa de los Espíritus, specifically at the narrative stance and the matriarchal nature of the narrative stance. We're going to talk about politics and how in Allende, in some ways, the politics that were sort of allegorical in Cien Años de Soledad, this very removed microcosm that, that Gabriel García Márquez was establishing, in many ways Allende takes that a step further and really grounds it in some very specific political events in Chile. So in some ways it feels to me like a more daring book. In some ways I see Cien Años de Soledad as kind of backward looking in some ways. It's looking at colonialism, it's looking at geography, whereas La Casa de los Espíritus really is 
grounding itself in a very specific time, in fact, the coup, the golpe de estado of Salvador Allende in the uh, mid-70s in Chile. So in, in some ways, it, it seemed kind of like the more daring book to me in some ways, because in fact, it was grounded in very real events that had enormous political weight. We're then going to talk about the close of the novels. It is fascinating. It's one of the most um, sort of intriguing and, and most interesting, in my mind, parallels between the two novels. And I love the way that these two novels both, um, they sort of, they share so much, but at the same time, there are lots of departures. So we're going to dive into some basics about these two authors. Gabriel García Márquez is from Colombia. He was born in 1927. Cien Años de Soledad comes out in 1967. It really is the novel that put him on the map. It's not his first, but it certainly is, is the most enormous. Um, anyone who's really wanting to deep, deep dive into that book, there is another lecture that was so fun to record that you can see either on YouTube or listen to as a podcast. Isabel Allende was born in Chile in 1942. La Casa de los Espíritus came out in 1982 in Spain, Notably, it was not published in Chile. It was, it was not, no one in Chile would touch it. Although, a few years later, um, when they were wanting to sort of feel more progressive, it did come out in Chile. Allende talks about this amazing period of time when people were smuggling this, this novel that had been printed in Spain into the country. She talks about them, you know, um, sending it to people or taking it without the cover or, you know, cutting it into chunks, which Honestly, I have to say, I got my copy down off of the shelf. And first of all, I couldn't read it, like, even with my weak readers on because the font was so, so teeny tiny. And it is so long. But, you know, it's a book that really merits that many pages and that many words because it is such a gigantic sweeping vision of Chile but it and of, and, and of one family. But it's also just absolutely delightful. Both of these books, you know, they're long. They're long. But I really... Um, it, I think even if I weren't in the mood to really dive into a long book, they are just, they're so captivating. And, you know, they really do offer a certain escape. And maybe um, as an American in late November of 2024, I am someone uh, who wants a little bit of an escape. And in fact, maybe part of what I'm looking for is, is a look at um, a, a, a governmental situation and a national situation that is even more fraught and in many ways even more unstable than I feel like our country is at the moment. So obviously they are from South American countries. They are from South American countries in the 20th century. So they're born sort of 20 years apart, um, but in fact, you know, they're somewhat contemporary, the books being, you know, um, a little bit less, in fact, than 20 years apart. So, um, and I want to, especially for American readers who, who, who have not immersed themselves in Latin American um, politics, not that I have, um, I'm, I'm just going to give this little caveat here. Again, I am looking at this through a literary lens, and I'm going to give some broad ideas of the political history, but uh, do not claim to be an expert. So what was extremely important, certainly when I was listening to Cien Años de Soledad, was this idea of colonialism, which seems so, so obvious. But it's really important to remember that the families that we are looking at in both of these novels are the result of colonialism. So obviously you have indigenous people in South America, and then you have the entrance of the Spanish. Both of these families in uh, Colombia and in Chile are, you know, th they are descendants of Spanish conquistadors. And you have, you know, in the 20th century, um, Cien Años de Soledad is like a little bit late. It's a little bit earlier. It's, you know, more sort of like late 19th century into the 20th century. La Casa de los Espíritus is from sort of like right before World War I until the coup, which was in the mid-70s. But both of them are looking at, at, you know, Latin American countries where colonialism was being challenged by these revolutionary forces. So when the, when the colonialists are coming in and setting things up, the way that it is set up, of course, is that you have these landowners, the latifundistas, who own all of the land and they have all of these people who work for them. I'm not exactly sure what you would call them, but they are people who are working the land. And then, of course, you have the, um, the indigenous peoples. So at one point, in the House of the Spirits, I think it's Esteban Trueba. Somebody says, like, that someone mentions the indigenous people, and they're like, well, there are only, like, 200 left, which was just a dagger to the heart for an American who is really um, thinking a lot about the, the genocide that we, in fact, perpetrated as the United States. So, um, you know, you have, you have this very clear social stratification. You have 
the indigenous people, you have the uh, people who are working the land on behalf of these landowners. And the landowners, that is where the wealth is concentrated. They own the land. And in, in both of the books, it's very important to remember that the family that we are looking at is an example, it, it is, a, is a result of this colonialist structure. And that in many ways, we should be questioning, you know, the, the certainly we are questioning Esteban Trueba and, and, you know, his conservative party that's really trying to maintain this status quo. But I think it's also very important to understand that all of this is happening in the shadow of colonialism. In both cases, in both of the books, there was a really important inciting event. So in the case of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, we have the Bogotazo, which was um, in 1948. So um, Garcia Marquez is like 20 years old. He's in law school. And someone assassinates the leader at the time, and they shut all the schools down, and the country is thrust into this decade-long, or sort of 15 years, of something called La Violencia. So this is this is this incredible time. 200,000 people were killed. Many, many were displaced. It was a time of incredible violence. Obviously, it's called the violence. And so that's happening sort of 1948 to 60, and 100 Years of Solitude comes out in 67. It's also an incredibly formative time in in Garcia Marquez's life. So it's really important to remember that when we have liberal and conservative factions in these books, or when we have political violence erupting, or the confusion of sort of who is on which side, these are things that are coming directly in many ways from the atmosphere in which Garcia Marquez was writing. For Isabel Allende, um, in some ways, it's even more stark. Um, so in 73, we have the Golpe de Estado, where Pinochet comes into power, he takes power from Salvador Allende. So this is a period of time, again, not an expert, it was sort of 25 to 50 years of what was known as kind of social democracy. So it was a time of, of relative stability in Chile. And in many ways, Chile was sort of held up as like the model South American country. I mean, we always have to ask the question, like, who is holding it up as a model? But Salvador Allende had a relatively short period of time as a fairly leftist leader. And then in 1973, we have the military coup of Pinochet coming into power. And, you know, this is a military coup that is happening. It's violent. So we can imagine Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you know, being deeply affected by this Bogotazo because his entire education kind of comes to a halt. And there's a lot of student involvement in what was happening at that time. And then, of course, the, the, the violence and in some ways for Allende, it would have been even a little bit more personal. So Salvador Allende was her godfather. Um, I just got that straight from Wikipedia. In some of the research that I read, someone said that um, she was his niece and someone else said that he was um, actually her father. And I was like, mm, that seems like a, a pretty big misstep. So I'm wondering if maybe, um, you know, way before the internet and maybe not uh, able to check the facts quite as easily as I just did. So, but regardless, she is intimately connected with this man who dies in this uh, in this military coup. So and, and then we have the, the very right leaning Pinochet come in. And what was so fascinating to me in both cases is the US involvement. I remember all of this rhetoric, um, you know, when I was young, well, certainly we all know about um, McCarthyism and all of the, the, the threat of communism, certainly in the 1950s. So this is a little bit later that both of these people are writing, but certainly communists were, you know, still very, very much, you know, kind of like a threat to the United States. I mean, I'm doing like, um, you know, quotation marks just because I, I really do have some kind of socialist leanings myself. I understand that communism and socialism are not great economic models. And certainly in Chile, um, you know, there was the, the, the socialism that was keeping the government relatively stable during the 50 years before the coup. It was not functioning super well. One of the things that happened um, that led to the coup was a lot of women being involved because, in fact, uh, it was very difficult to get food, um, you know, just sort of basic necessities were difficult to attain. So I know that some of my political thoughts are, are a bit theoretical and certainly a bit, um, you know, naive even. But this idea of the U.S. as being so involved, I mean, in 100 Years of Solitude, of course, we have the, uh, the, the presence of this United Fruit Company. Actually, that's the real name of it. Um, it's La Compañía Bananera. But and I think it was like, it might even be like the American Fruit Company. You know, you have to remember, I, I listened to this book about, I don't know, six weeks ago, a month ago, and my memory is not that great. But we certainly have a, a very large player in the book and a huge decider of destiny of the Buendia family takes the shape of this American company that comes in and is essentially exploiting both workers and the land in Colombia. 
And then when you look at, I just couldn't believe it. I was looking at, you know, some of the stuff about the coup in Chile and it, it was all Nixon backed. So we, you know, this is like the United States is directly involved in the ascension of Pinochet and in the dissolution of the Allende government. Um, I actually was discussing this with my husband, and he was remembering that there was something called the Chicago Boys. So there was a, an economics professor at the University of Chicago, and he brought five Chilean men up to um, Chicago, and he had them, I think they had doctoral degrees by the end of this whole thing, but the idea was that they were going to go back, and under Pinochet, they presumably... They were going to put in place this like radical free market model of, e of economics. So you're going from, you know, the government is doing everything for the market to this like radical free market thing. And, and, in, it, and it's kind of crazy to think of the ways that the United States was manipulating this whole thing. I think it, it viewed Chile as like this, this blank slate where they could go in and try this economic model and, and see how it did. I mean, it, it was absolutely shocking to me to get the background and to understand the many different ways in which the United States was involved in these two countries. Okay, we're going to take a closer look at the two novels right now. We're going to talk about the parallels between them. So in both of them, we have the presence of a patriarchy. We have José Arcadio. We see maybe six or seven generations of the Buendía family. Famously, that is a um, that is a book where it's very difficult to keep everybody straight. And, um, and I love this kind of like literary hack, which is that if you are reading something and you're like, oh my God, I cannot keep all these characters straight. I'm going to make an elaborate family tree in the back of the book. You might want to take a, you know, a moment and one if in fact that is purposeful. So I think in many ways we are not supposed to keep all of the Buendías straight because in fact this is talking about how history repeats itself and how families and, and hereditary characteristics are going to sort of mandate that the same thing is happening over and over. And indeed things are repeating themselves through the generations. And you also get a sense of just how rigid this patriarchy is in that the name is so important and that for example Aureliano is totally inflexible about naming all of his children after himself, which is Essentially, I mean, it becomes farcical. I think they're like 14 Aurelianos and, and most of them end up in front of firing squads. And I think at one point, you know, um, I, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of his wife. That's terrible. But she's like, how about we name the baby something else? Um, but she says another name and he's like, absolutely not. It's going to be another Aureliano. So this idea of perpetuating the patriarchy and the rigidity of the patriarchy is, is very clear in 100 Years of Solitude. You also have it with Esteban Garcia, with Esteban Trueba. Oh my gosh, I said Esteban Garcia because of course he is the um he he's, he's sort of he's the illegitimate son and in fact ends up being a very important player in the book but you have um this very clear presence of the patriarchy but in many ways it is undermined by the women in the book who really are um we're going to get to this in a minute who really are the lifeblood of the book Esteban Trueba for me he has a voice in the novel he um you know he narrates certain chapters in the first person, but in many ways he is someone who is diminished throughout the book. He's literally shrinking at the end of the book. And, and in many ways, you know, we see his political commitments and we also see, you know, the way that he wants to keep his land, the Tres Marias, and he wants to keep everything the way it is and, and maintain all of his wealth. But you also, I mean, the overriding idea that you have toward the end is his devotion both to his, um, his wife, Clara, and also to his granddaughter, Alba. So in both of these novels, obviously, we have gigantic family sagas. In um, Again, in, in Cien Años de Soledad, I think it's like six or seven generations. In um, in uh, The Casa de los Espíritus, it's actually clearer to me. It's four generations because, in fact, we have these four women who very clearly, um, it, it's a very matriarchal situation in many ways, but these four women stand for these four generations uh, that are very clearly demarcated by uh, by the women. So... In both books, we also do have this matriarchy. In many ways, Ursula is like a very, very important presence. She, in fact, lives through the hundred years. She outlives her husband. For most of the time, Jose Arcadio is like, well, not most of the time, but a lot of the time he's like chained out underneath the tree. And she is really holding everything together. Um, both of these novels, it, it, you know, a lot was made in the scholarship of the fact that, that women are certainly in the domestic zone. They are, are in the private sphere, not in the public sphere. But in both books, the, the house like literally the house and the domestic world are incredibly important. I mean, so much is made of the house in both of the books. You could write 
I mean, many, many people could write dissertations on, you know, the, the structure of the houses. And, you know, when you are reading, you should always look at the house as a metaphor and, and sort of a symbol of the family or the state or both. So in both of these cases, we have women who are very strong and we have in many ways sort of matriarchal presences and matriarchal um, lines that are that are very well drawn throughout. But they certainly are in the domestic sphere. So the counterpoint to Ursula, which is interesting to me, um, she's sort of multiplied when we get to La Casa de los Espíritus. So we have Nivea, Clara, Blanca, and Alba. So all of these are, are um, words that, that can mean white, um, Nivea being kind of a snow white, Clara being like clear, um, also just like a very common name, Blanca being white, also a common name, and Alba meaning dawn, like sort of the, the dawn light. So all of these words, um, all of these names have to do with illumination, which is important and sort of lighting things up. And, um, you know, with whiteness, I would argue, uh, I did not see this in the scholarship, but this is one of those weird uh, sort of colonialist moments in my mind where we really are, um, you know, we're really doubling down on the idea of whiteness. So um, there, there's certain, I think, you know, you could do a lot with white and dark and uh, in terms of skin color and in terms of, of this ruling class as, as definitely having descended from people who are white and that being something that Allende, it's, there's not a lot of like um, examination of that. Certainly on her part, it would be very interesting to take a close look at that. We also, um, you know, speaking of the way that Aureliano was like adamant that his son, all of his sons be named Aureliano, we have um, in the case of Clara, she um, she has three children. She has Blanca, but her two boys are named Jaime and Nicolas. And it is radical in my mind that here in this book, as soon as we have, um, well, as soon as we have kind of legitimate sons who are being recognized in the family, and it is very much Clara who decides that she wants to name them that. I think Esteban is even like, wait, shouldn't we name them Esteban? And she's like, um, no, we're going to go with Jaime and Nicolas. So it, you have a very direct, I think, counterpoint and, and sort of a riposte on the part of Allende, who is, is really pushing against this idea of all of the names being the same in subsequent generations in 100 Years of Solitude. In both novels, we have a sex worker who has tremendous power. I loved this about both of them. We have Pilar Ternera in A um, Hundred Years of Solitude, who really is, you know, she comes back again and again throughout the book. She really does have a lot of power. And then we have Transito Soto in, in um, La Casa de los Espíritus, who's even more powerful and even more prominent. She is someone who has enormous power over Esteban Trueba throughout the course of the book and throughout the course of his life. She is one of these women that, you know, has survived generations and in the end, you know, there's that um, kind of gross scene in some ways where she has this sexual encounter with a very old and very diminished Esteban Trueba. So you have this sense of her maintaining her power and her youth and her strength where, where the patriarch is diminishing. Also, it is absolutely crucial to realize that Transito Soto is the person who allows for Alba's release. I mean, this is a woman who is a sex worker, but who also, you know, she's the madam. I, I don't know what the word is for like the person who runs, the, you know, the, I don't even know, is it a brothel? I don't know what we call this, the the, the house of sex workers. Um, I don't, I, oh my gosh, it's crazy that we don't have a word. I mean, brothel is not great. Um, whorehouse, definitely not. But we have this woman who is, you know, she, she runs this very effective and very lucrative business. But more importantly, she has very close ties with the military, which is crazy. I mean, the military are the ones who are, are sort of leapfrogging over the latifundistas. They're leapfrogging over the landholders. And they're the ones who are seizing power. And she, so she's not even like, you know, linked with Esteban Trueba. She is, in fact, linked with the military who are going to go on um, and sort of supersede the landowners and take power as a military entity. So it's crucial that at the end it is Transito Soto who is able to, um, you know, provide, for, you know, for the release of Alba from this terrible situation of torture. So I loved the idea that in both cases we have uh, sex workers who are really empowered and very important people. Um, it's also very important to note that there's a lot of um, of sexual assault. There's a lot of incest. There's a lot of rape in these books. Um, interesting to me, and and this was something that that. It wasn't even that subtle, really. But in 100 Years of Solitude, there's this enormous emphasis on sex and on procreation and on incest. They're very concerned about incest, of course, because the Buendia family is isolated, you know, in its own uh, sort of like tiny little... Uh, 
space in Colombia. And so they're very concerned about, you know, not being able to procreate well because there it is sort of incestuous. But there is this idea about, um, you know, continuing the estirpe, like continuing the line and, and, and procreation. So there's this enormous emphasis on sex. And a lot of it is sexual assault kind of stuff that's happening in A Hundred Years of Solitude. And then what we see in La Casa de los Espíritus is a real emphasis on rape. So in the beginning of the book, we have Esteban Trueba raping Pancha and Pancha Garcia, whose son then, you know, Esteban, the, the illegitimate son of the latifundista, um, then of, the, of, of Esteban, the owner of the hacienda, then he becomes very important. And at the very end of the book, he in fact rapes Alba in a way that completes this kind of circle. Like we literally have bookends of rape in this book. And it was very important to me, and, and I think really important in many ways, that, that the focus on sort of incest in A Hundred Years of Solitude, which for a man might be kind of like the biggest sex concern, becomes a really graphic and really terrible instance of lots and lots of rapes throughout the entire course of the book in the House of the Spirits, which of course for a woman writer would be much more concerning and much more violating and much more horrific. So it, it was a very interesting thing to look at the preoccupation of sex in both of the books, but in the different ways that it manifests itself. Also, very importantly, and we're going to talk about this at the very end, at the end of these books, we have um, the last of the line, or, or not, in, actually, in the case of the House of the Spirits, it is definitively not the last of the line, which is significant, and we're going to talk about that later. But in A Hundred Years of Solitude, we have Aureliano, um, and, and he is in the house, and the, the ojarasca is beginning, this leaf storm is happening, and the jungle is kind of subsuming the house. And in fact, the child of this Aureliano has just been eaten by ants. So you have this definitive end to the family. We have the hundred years, we have the many generations, and, and, and that family is going to end definitively. So we have a single person at the end who is, in fact, telling the story that we are holding in our hands. Importantly, when Aureliano is doing this, he is reading from this kind of encoded Sanskrit manuscript left by Melquiades, whereas in the House of the Spirits, we have Alba writing her story that is, in fact, the story of the whole family. It is, of course, incorporating the, the, the record that Clara keeps when she is deciding to be uh, mute in the beginning of the book. And, and we know this right from the start. There's a very clear, in the very first couple of sentences, very clear introduction of the idea that Clara's words are what Alba is copying. There's a first person narration, which we're gonna get to. We have Alba at the very beginning telling us that this is her story and it's the story of the women in her family. We also have some love letters from, from Blanca along the way that are incorporated and we have Alba's own thoughts. So you have um, someone at the very end of the book um, in A Hundred Years of Solitude is Aureliano, it's the end of the line and the book is written by someone outside the family, but in, in the uh, House of the Spirits, We have the same thing. We have one person there who is, you know, writing down. It's that, that tricky kind of meta thing where it's like, oh my gosh, the book that we are holding in our hands is actually being written by one of the characters. But very importantly, in her case, she is writing it. It is the voices of all of these women, also the voices of Esteban Garcia, of Esteban Trueba. I think I'm going to keep doing that throughout the whole uh, lecture. Very importantly, there were so many instances of very scholarly uh, pieces of work about these two books where... They just didn't talk at all about the narration of Esteban Trueba, which is crucial. I mean, you have to understand it is the voice of all of these women, and yet we have these incursions in the first person, we're going to talk about this in a minute, where we have Esteban Trueba's actual voice, and it's very important to look at the interplay between the voices of all of these women. But back to the point of the parallels, we have a single person at the end who is, is holding the book, but in the case of Alba, she is pregnant. We don't know if... This baby is, uh, you know, the product of rape on the part of, of Esteban Garcia or whether it is the, ch the love child of Alba with Pedro Tercero Garcia. But you have this, so we don't know if it's like the right dictator, torturer guy, or if it is the leftist revolutionary. And it really doesn't matter. So we have this idea because it is hers. It's very explicitly like she doesn't really care because this baby is her baby, which is such a radical way to think about it. But at the end of the House of the Spirits, we have the single person writing, but she is in the act of creation, both in the sense that she is creating this novel and also that she is creating the future generation. Whereas in A Hundred Years of Solitude, we have, you know, the end of the line. The future generation has just been eaten by ants gross. 
like, but also incredible. I mean, just incredible. Um, in both of the situations, both of the books, um, we have some sort of a haunting. We have lots of ghosts that are coming uh, into the narrative in ways that are very powerful. Usually there's someone who has just recently died and it's someone who's sort of able to, um, you know, pierce the veil, someone who's able to come and go. We also in both books have uh, like a decent amount of suspicion of progress. So um, it, very famously and importantly, at the very beginning of 100 Years of Solitude, it is um, one of the characters, Aureliano, I'm fairly certain, remembering when his father was showing him ice and this invention that in fact was going to allow, you know, for the really in some ways for, for people to take advantage of the South American countries because it was going to allow for all sorts of transport of produce. But so throughout the book, you have um, suspicion of progress. There's a little bit of that in the House of the Spirits with the telephone. The telephone is, you know, people are suspicious of the telephone. But it's it's interesting to me, in both books, you have this suspicion of progress. It is much more pronounced in 100 Years of Solitude than it is in the House of the Spirits. Uh, for my money, again, um, 100 Years of Solitude is concerned, you know, you have that Spanish galleon ship and you have a lot of, um, you know, characters who are from Europe. You have a lot of sort of looking to Europe in many ways. And th this idea of progress is, is very uh, disconcerting. There are many, many different examples of, of sort of science and progress that are very threatening to the people in the novel. Whereas in the House of the Spirits, it's kind of like we have dispensed with that concern because we have much bigger fish to fry. Okay, we're now going to move on and talk about magic realism. Um, if, I always feel at some point like I need to say this to, to my listeners. If you can hear loud snoring um that is two of the dogs who are in here it's so loud it's so loud um, i think this microphone's pretty good i think it's like you know phasing out a bunch of the noise uh, that, that's happening around me but if if you hear loud snoring um that's some dogs uh, in the midst here of the uh, fox page lecture so magic realism, um, again, Garcia Marquez was sort of the person who, who kind of like invented this. And it's very important to take a quick look at what is happening here. So Garcia Marquez in many ways was kind of um, educated and really steeped in the 19th century European novel. So in many ways, the realist novel, which was, you know, this kind of 19th century, think Flaubert, um, he's being sort of, you know, the main guy, Madame Bovary was like in 1851. So this was a novel that was somewhat democratic. It was trying to capture the whole entire world. And it was doing so through this omniscient third person narrator and lots and lots of detail and a focus that was kind of focusing a little more on the middle class. So in the case of magic realism, you're building on this colonialist form, which is really important. I think sometimes that gets lost in all of the supernatural stuff. So it's very important to look at the fact that Garcia Marquez, who is, I think, in many ways, very concerned with the colonialist overlay onto the indigenous people of South America, it, it is a very like European form that he is taking and then, uh, you know, changing in many very important ways. So the key to, um, understanding magic realism it drives me absolutely insane there's so many people that basically use it just like for fantasy um it's not it's not the same as fantasy so essentially what's happening with realism is you have a story that is entirely realistic that could be you know just it could be henry james it could be john steinbeck but you have things that are happening in it that are not possible in the real world these kind of supernatural events are occurring it is very important also that the people in the book are not like oh my god rosa la bella is like uh, you know ascending into the heavens like nobody everybody thinks that what is happening is normal when the magnet comes through town and pulls all the nails out of the um, all of the homes in Macondo, you know, n no one is like particularly surprised. Or when that little drop of blood from one of her sons, you know, goes like weaving all the way through town and is hopping curbs and, you know, crossing streets and makes its way to Ursula, she's not surprised by the fact that the blood is doing this. She's simply alarmed that one of her children is dead. So it's, it's a very important thing that we have this very realistic sort of world where we have these kinds of incursions of the supernatural and everybody is responding to them appropriately, but in ways that, 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 that they believe in what is happening. This is not, it doesn't seem like something supernatural. Interestingly, both Allende and uh, Garcia Marquez grew up with their grandparents. And in the case of Garcia Marquez, very famously, he said that he said that his grandmother would tell these stories with a lot of elements that were not, um, you know, not logical and not possible and telling them as if, as if they were fact, putting them on the same par as, as things that were entirely natural. So, um, very much like realism, magic realism has lots and lots of detail. These are novels that are trying to present the whole entire world to the reader. 
importantly, real, the realist novel is fairly linear in terms of its time. And magic realism has this characteristic where it's multisynchronous, polysynchronous, however you want to think about it. It's not this linear time. In the narration, we have lots of like things happening. And then Allende saying, but that that wasn't going to happen for, you know, many decades or, um, you know, something or we'll have one of the Aurelianos thinking of himself in front of the firing squad. Um, but that will be happening when he's a young man. So there's lots of a moving forward and backward in time. And I think we can look at that as this important underscoring of the way that time is cyclical and the way that history is cyclical and the way that things don't really change so that you can have, um, you know, it's not a progressive like moving forward in time. It is, in fact, this idea of things looping around and things repeating themselves. And certainly that we have these kinds of cycles in politics and we have these cycles in history. So the idea of being able to, to move back and forth in time, it, it's as if time can, can sort of hold all of these different things in any given moment. Importantly also, the, the magic realism movement keeps the omniscient narrator for the most part. So we have a third person omniscient narrator in the realist novel and also the magic realist. So it's, this is very important, and it, for some of you, it might be kind of a subtle thing, but this simply means that, that the story is told like he did this, and she did this, and Aureliano did that, and, you know, Pancha Garcia did this. Um, it, it, it's told in the third person from a narrator that is very far away, and a narrator that is indeed omniscient. This is a narrator who is reporting things to us, but who knows all. And it's kind of, um, and it's important to think of like the God-like overtones of this. There is someone who is telling this story in a way that is very authoritative and that is very removed and someone who seems like they have control over how the story is told. A certain entity that's kind of this all-knowing, controlling idea. So with Garcia Marquez, the, this omniscient narrator stays in place. We have an omniscient narrator throughout. It's all third person, and it's all fairly distanced. But in Allende, we have a departure. She does the coolest thing, and we're going to look at the beginning of the novel because I think it's worth taking a look at how she slips from the third to the first and back again. It's really, really well done. So the book feels like it's a third person narration, and it is almost all in the third person in the sense that you know, you're reading dialogue or you're reading, um, you know, a description of a scene. And it is as if, uh, you know, it's reporting that, that Jean de Satigny is doing something and that, you know, someone else is doing something. It feels like a third person narration. But it's important to remember that it is, in fact, Alba. And we have Alba at the very beginning saying, you know, it was very helpful that my grandmother wrote all this stuff down because then I am using it to tell this story. And then she immediately slips into all of the stuff about Barabbas, the, the dog that has arrived. And it's also crucial to remember that we have the, the, the voice of Alba. We also have these, um, you know, these chunks that are put in where we have the first person voice of Esteban Trueba. So there are some departures in Allende where she moves from this third person omniscient narrator that is so typical of the realist novel and magic realism. And she's putting it into the voices, in most cases, of women. The large part of the novel are uh, women's voices. And you might be like, well, what's the point of that? Like, why, why is that so important? But if you take one minute and think about it, you understand. I mean, these are these are voices of women who have historically, and certainly in realist fiction, have not, in fact, had their voices heard. I mean, you know, the, the giants of realist fiction are not women novelists. And, and any time, I mean, it, it, looking at narrative voice is always, I think, a very good way to look at a piece of literature. But it is important to think about who is telling the story because, in fact, that person has power and that person really colors any piece of literature in a certain way. So it's very important that we are not even just hearing from one woman, we are hearing from, you know, this entire line of women with like some little interspersings of the patriarch. So this is the perfect segue, in fact, into this idea of the narrative stance of, of uh, House of the Spirits. So I think we can say without reservation that this is a feminist novel. And, and I love that about it. I mean, in the Fox page and many of our lectures, we're sort of like, you know, can this be read as a feminist novel? And you have to sort of think about like, well, this part is not, in fact, very feminist. But in this case, it is really very clear that Allende is using um, a genre that was really um, put on the map by the Latin American boom, by the biggest writer of the Latin American boom. So this was a, a whole rash of books um, that came out in the 60s and the 70s in Latin America. It was a huge time of, of really incredible writing coming out of South America. And Garcia Marquez being in many ways sort of the, the, the most well-known, at least by Americans, of that group. So, And they were all men for the most part. 
I mean, I can't even think of a woman from, from that boom. So a little later in 82, we have Allende coming and using, you know, a, a woman writer who is, um, who is coming to the fore and using this genre that was made famous by kind of, you know, the brightest light of the boom. And yet she's very much making it her own. So um, not only do we have women's voices, which is kind of inherently feminist, but we also have lots and lots of strong women. Again, these are women who are, um, you know, they're limited to the domestic sphere. They're almost always in, you know, the big house on the corner, but they have enormous power over the men in their lives. And simply um, the way that the narrative, you know, we're hearing about the lives of these women and the, the men are sort of woven in and out, but they're not the main characters. I mean, sometimes they are. And Esteban Trueba, you can definitely argue that he's one of the main characters, certainly. But but for the most part, someone like Jean de Satigny, who is, you know, the, this big European, uh, you know, expat, and he comes in and he's going to, you know, be this incredible wife, this incredible husband for Blanca. Um, and in fact, he ends up being this kind of, you know, depraved person, which that actually, that was a difficult part for me to read. Because in fact, with Jean de Satigny, um, when he has this, this room, this basement, that's like this place of all this sexual perversion, which I didn't, I mean, I don't know why we're kink shaming here. Just kidding. I mean, I know why Allende would be doing that. I, well, Actually, I don't know why, but like he, it's meant like his sexual proclivities are meant to show that he's like this kind of monstrous person. What was interesting and very troubling to me is that the people who were involved in these kinds of sexual exploits with him were all Indians and they're very explicitly uh, called Indios. And for me, I mean, I, I, mostly I was like, okay, Jean de Satigny is really taking advantage of a group of people, but I didn't love it that one of the main times that we see the indigenous population, it is in fact in this really, um, what is meant to be a very like sort of depraved situation. So, I mean, there are some very problematic things in this novel, but the not, but the feminist piece of it, I think um, in many ways is really deep and is really uh, a very powerful. And very briefly before I read uh, the first paragraph, I want to just address quickly this, this idea of these passages where Esteban Trueba is telling his story in the first person. It's very jarring when I was listening to it on Audible to then suddenly have a man's voice. It's like more jarring, I think, than it was when you were reading it in the novel form. And in the novel form, it's not set apart in any way. It's just like one of these numbered chapters, you know, several of them are just told in the first person from Esteban Trueba. So a couple of things that are very important, and I didn't find anything in the scholarship about this, which was just shocking to me. Also, like literally, there wasn't even any acknowledgement of the fact that we hear the first person narration of this patriarch. So a couple of things. First of all, the fact that the women are telling the story in this omniscient third person narration means that they have this power. They they can, you know, report all of the dialogue that's happening. They can report scenes that like Clara's not writing the book, you know, with with in her like journals or whatever. She's not giving all of this um, you know, all of this detail and beautiful connective tissue and beautiful language. So there's a way in which these women, when they are writing in the third person, have this power to both um, apprehend and understand what is going on around them, but also to present it in this very powerful and very um, sort of traditionally masculine voice, which is this omniscient, uh, all-knowing, authoritative narrative stance. When we have Esteban Trueba, he is speaking in the first person, and it feels slightly confessional. It feels like he might be writing a diary. Um, I'm saying that on purpose. It's not a journal. Like, it feels very intimate, the things that he is saying. He's often talking about his feelings. And the fact that it is in the first person, it makes it seem very um, uh, sort of vulnerable and, in fact, very small in some ways. It also, for me, that this kind of these first person chunks, I'd always be like, oh, my God, wait, why? Why is he talking now? It, it, I didn't really look forward to them. And I kind of wanted to, you know, get them over with because I wanted to get back to the story of these amazing women. And I think that in some ways is purposeful. I mean, you're not wanting to rush through them because it's always interesting what he was saying, but it is not as appealing. So one of the things that's happening is the voice of this patriarch is reinforcing these like little incursions, is reinforcing the fact that most of what we are hearing is a very powerful voice of these woven together women's voices. So for my money, one of the things that's happening is it's simply reinforcing the fact that it's kind of radical that we have all of these women's voices. When we hear the one little man talking, you know, you're like, wow, wait, we also have these other, uh, you know, three women's voices. It also, in fact, just serves to underscore how monstrous he is. So this was very important to me. Right from the beginning, when I realized we were going to be hearing his voice, I was like, oh my God, 
is she going to try to make us sympathize with him? Because he's not, he's not a good dude. Like he's not someone who is doing good things in this book. He's raping all sorts of people. He's not acknowledging his sons. He's not being fair to his workers. He's not, he's totally dismissive of the indigenous people. So I was like, wait, is she going to try to make us sympathize with him? And for the most part, no, um, this is, he, he just sounds even more staunch and more reactionary and more like horrible when he is describing his perspective on things. So I was in some ways very gratified because she's not trying to make us think he's like, okay. And that would be the temptation. If you were going to have the first person, it would be like, you know, that he would have like a lot of regrets or that he would feel, um, you know, somehow like that he was helping the, the people who are working for him. And that does not happen. So I was very satisfied that, that these short incursions also just serve to underscore like the monstrousness of this man. And, and toward the end, when we have his t parts, they generally speak to his vulnerability because they're a lot about Clara and they're a lot about how much he loves her and how she was really very powerful and kind of wouldn't deign to have sex with him, wouldn't deign to talk to him, wouldn't deign to, to, to be like really even in the same room with him. So at the end, what we have is this very diminished, very weakened person who is, is really, um, you know, lovesick for this woman who really will just have nothing to do with him. So I think taking a look at this at this male voice this first person voice is very important for all the ways that that it bolsters the the feminist nature of the book and i will also say that you know this is the patriarch this is like the person who's like the the the, the sort of the one who's in control and the one who was able to resurrect las tres marias and he, you know who has kind of all this power and success and what's interesting too is it's not that special you're like, there's nothing really like impressive about his mind or about what he is saying or thinking. And so in some ways, it's also kind of like neutering the patriarch. It's like when we are actually hearing his words, you're like, mm, whatever, like he doesn't sound smart and he doesn't sound, uh, you know, like any of the virtues that you would want from someone who is supposed to be this leader of the entire family. So that was another way in which it kind of diffuses the idea of the strength of the patriarch. So when I spoke about um, 100 Years of Solitude, we didn't even look at any of the text because I was already worried about doing it any kind of justice. And in this case, I also, I mean, it, the, the writing is so spectacular and there's so many different things we could talk about that I was like, I don't think we should even dip into the writing, which for those of you who have listened to the Fox page for a long time know that, you know, looking closely at the text is, is one of the main ways that we are taking, um, you know, these deep dives into amazing books. But... The reason I want to look at the opening of the House of the Spirits is because it is so specifically um, and so like ingeniously giving an example or, or, or like sort of setting the tone of this narration and this narrative voice. And it is done so, so skillfully. Um, I also realized when I was looking for a copy, I only have Spanish copies of the of both of these books of 100 Years of Solitude and the House of the Spirits. Um, I didn't. I just don't, it didn't occur to me that I wouldn't have an English version. So I'm going to read this in Spanish. Um, am I going to try to translate it? I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Um, capítulo primero, Rosa la Bella. Barrabás llegó a la familia por vía marítima, anotó la niña Clara con su delicada caligrafía. Ya entonces tenía el hábito de escribir las cosas importantes. Y más tarde, cuando se quedó muda, Escribía también las trivialidades sin sospechar que 50 años después sus cuadernos me servirían para rescatar la memoria del pasado y para sobrevivir a mi propio espanto. Ok, incredible. So we have in the very beginning here, um, Barrabás llegó a la familia por vía marítima. So this, this dog is arriving, you know, by, by, by ocean, by sea. Anotó la niña Clara con su delicada caligrafía. So we have this idea of a young Clara who is writing this down. Right at the very beginning, we have a young girl who is in the act of writing. She's in the act of creating. We have a sense of a woman who's at the very beginning. In fact, a young woman, only a girl at this point. And she is, in fact, the second young girl that we should be thinking, or the second girl we should be thinking about because the name of the title is Rosa la Bella. So we know we're going to hear about someone called Rosa la Bella, but we also, um, we're beginning the narration with this idea of Clara. So that is in the third person. We have this idea, anotó la niña Clara. So, you know, wrote down Clara. So we have this idea of the third person telling us what it is that Clara is doing. And we have this idea, again, of third person, this dog is arriving, wrote Clara. So we have this kind of sense of Clara as being in the third person. And then we have, Ya entonces tenía el hábito de escribir las cosas importantes y más tarde, cuando se quedó muda, 
escribía también las trivialidades sin sospechar que 50 años después sus cuadernos me servirían para rescatar la memoria del pasado. Me servirían. So it's very, um, it's very subtle here. She's, she's writing down all of the important things and then she's writing down the trivial things when she decides to not speak anymore, which serve me well. So we have this, the, the, the mention of the first person is very subtle. It's not like I wrote these things down. It's like, you know, it was good for me because she was writing all of these things down. We don't even have like a yo, it's not a I did this. It's very subtle and it is so well done because it sort of feels still like it's third person. It feels very much like the realist novel. It's very much like a 19th century novel because we have several different people, we have description, we have what feels like a third person narrator. And so then we have, me servirían para rescatar la memoria del pasado y para sobrevivir a mi propio espanto. So they are going to help her not only resuscitate the past, but also to get over some sort of um, scare that she has suffered. So we're also building some tension there about like, what is it? First of all, We don't know who this person is who's writing, which I love. I mean, the idea that we don't know that Alba is writing it until the end, it's one of my favorite things, um, you know, in literature when we have a, a narrator. It's like um, Lolita. We don't know, who, in fact, who is writing this story. And it's really one of the key elements of the book. For those of you who are listening because you want to become like better readers, I will just say pay attention. I mean, this is the kind of thing, because it's so skillfully done and so subtle, you might just think we're reading a third person here and not really pick up on this very subtle first person. But in fact, you get so much more out of the book if you recognize that there's someone who is writing this whole novel as a cathartic thing for this espanto that she has suffered, this, this, this you know, scare, this, this uh, thing that has happened to her. So um, I wanted to read that just to give a sense of how like subtle and yet how um, really important, you know, we have three people who are introduced, Rosa la Bella, Clara, and then this writer. We don't know the sex of the writer yet, but you have this introduction of these voices. It's just so, so well done. Okay, now that we've looked at the opening of the novel and we've taken um, you know, a pretty long look here at the, the narrative stance and the importance of that in terms of the feminist nature of the book, We're now going to take a little closer look at the politics and the ways in which um, I, I found them much more harrowing and compelling in The House of the Spirits than in A Hundred Years of Solitude. I mentioned earlier that in A Hundred Years of Solitude, the politics are, are, are very sort of allegorical and very sort of theoretical. So um, th again, there's a lot of concern about the past. We have the Spanish galleon. We have this idea of, 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 of setting up a town, of sort of how do you set up a town And again, these are descendants of the Spanish conquistadores. So you have this idea of, of, of sort of a colonial thing that Jose Arcadio Buendía is doing. His name is Spanish. The names of his children are Spanish. So you have this very kind of colonial feel of some sort of fly buzzing around here. Um, so you have this very colonial feel at the very beginning of the book. And when we start getting into the politics, it's very kind of muddy. Like there's that one point where Aureliano decides he's going to be a leftist and someone's like, you don't even know what that means. There's a lot of... Um, There's a lot of a murkiness in terms of like what the left stands for and what the right stands for. And there's an enormous amount of violence and then there's enormous amount of like people switching sides. So it's this very confusing kind of melee that the family is kind of dipping into and out of. And I really appreciated that. I mean, I think in, in many ways it, it, it spoke, in fact, and speaks, it continues to speak, to, to sort of the difficulty of, of this kind of, it's not like civil war, but it is this idea of, of you know, um, of a country turning on itself and how difficult it is, in fact, to, I mean, it's spoken like a true American, you know, who we just like go and like have wars elsewhere and it's very obvious to us. I mean, that also speaks to race. It speaks to all sorts of terrible things, frankly. But the way, in fact, that, that war... The way, in fact, that politics are, are, are shown here is very much about confusion and, and not a lot of conviction. So again, in The House of the Spirits, I think things get much more concrete and in many ways they're, they're much more uh, interesting to me. So part of the reason why A uh, Hundred Years of Solitude is allegorical is because we just have the one family. We have the Buendia family. I mean, obviously there's some other people who are coming and going. But for the most part, we're talking about one family in a very isolated piece of land in Colombia. In the House of the Spirits, we in fact have people in the capital. We, we have all of these actual historical events that are happening. The, a terrible earthquake happened in Chile. And in fact, in the book, Clara, who is Clara Clarividente, who can see things into the future, um, you know, she's a seer. She actually foretells 
well, she foretells a lot of stuff, but one of the things she foretells is the fact that this terrible um, earthquake is going to happen. So we have a book that is not, you know, about a little isolated family out in the middle of nowhere in a South American country. It's, it's a relatively identifiable country where you have, you know, you have Las Tres Marias, so you have kind of a model for, for what like one family's world would look like, very much like the Buendia family in Macondo. But then you also have people who are in the capital, you have people who are traveling around, you have a much wider cast of characters. It's not simply the one family with various characters coming in and out. You, I mean, it is sort of that, but you also have a lot of other people who, who are, are more central, in fact, to uh, what is happening in the House of the Spirits. So we also, um, when we have the, the leftist sons, which we also have in uh, 100 Years of Solitude, when we have Jaime and Nicolás, um, God, it's so embarrassing. I'm fairly, it's Jaime. Jaime is the one who is, uh, who is becoming very leftist and who is, and then we have the Pedros, Pedro Segundo and Pedro Tercero, who are both, you know, from the beginning, those people are, are, are very committed leftist revolutionaries. So we have our, um, our conservative patriarch, but then we have, you know, both one of his sons and then one of his illegitimate sons becomes very uh, dictatorial and very uh, far to the right. But we have these 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 young men who are who have a lot of political conviction, and you know there's scenes of like you know student protests and when they're taking over the the schools and they are um, really clear about what they are standing up for. And there are a bunch of different times in the House of the Spirits where you know one of these people is trying to explain to Esteban Garcia why in fact um, you know the people who are working the land should actually own pieces of land and should not simply be working, you know, under the whims of this patriarchal uh, latifundista. So we have very specific political ideologies, and they're unwavering, and, and, and they're, they're sort of doing a lot of the things that someone in Chile in the 60s and 70s would be doing. And we have a description of, in fact, the coup. We have, um, which is so bold and is so interesting. And in many ways, again, uh, the politics in the House of the Spirits, it felt much more compelling. I mean, I, I liked the way that 100 Years of Solitude made it feel kind of muddy and, and difficult and, and unclear in terms of allegiance or in terms of, you know, what people are actually fighting for. Whereas in the Casa de los Espíritus, it's, it's really very clear in lots of ways that, that seemed much more bold to me. And um, speaking of specific things, in some ways it's a roman à clé, like a... Um, was the word like a like a novel where where you have specific people? So El Poeta is Neruda, um, Pablo Neruda. He's obviously the very important uh, poet of that time. So you have people coming in, you know, to the novel who are historical figures. Also, Jaime is um, maybe modeled after one of Allende's um, the, the the leader Allende, um, one of his doctor. And then Miguel is is I think modeled maybe or at least somewhat on on an important singer of the time. So if you were reading this in Chile after you know the book was like imported to you in big chunks from Spain it would feel very situated in the moment in a way I think that would be very very compelling because you would know uh, you know th these are very specific characters they're operating in a country that is very much like Chile that has suffered some of the same catastrophes that Chile has suffered so so in that sense I really was left um, with with a sense of the boldness of Allende and, and the importance of really being very clear about what is happening in the country in, in a way uh, th that felt like a little bit beyond colonialism and that was looking a little bit more toward, uh, you, you know, this dictatorial right-leaning threat that became very, very real for Allende. So I'm realizing that we are getting to the end of the lecture, like kind of all of a sudden here. Um, I wanted to just talk briefly about the close of the novels, but I realize I've already sort of done that. So, um, you know, interestingly and very importantly, they end in, in very similar ways. You have a single person who is, you know, a descendant, a young person in the family. In, in the case of 100 Years of Solitude, it is Aureliano, whose son has just been eaten by ants. And Aureliano, who is, you know, about to be subsumed by this natural catastrophe, by the jungle, by the, by the landscape of Colombia, and he is, in fact, reading someone else's words and translating them into this book that we are holding in our hands. In some ways, Allende is much clearer about it in a way that I, I, um, I both kind of liked it. It felt a little bit like hand-holding. It felt like a little bit like we were being babied at the end, which I don't think was entirely necessary. I mean, gosh, that seems like a big criticism to, to level at this point when I've just been lauding the book. But you'll see in just a minute. I am actually going to read the, the last paragraph to you. 
But what I love, again, and I'm, I'm happy to repeat myself here, is that we are ending with a young woman, Alba, who comes from this long line of women whose names are, are similar but not the same. I mean, this is a matriarchy that, that, unlike the patriarchy where everybody has the exact same name, where things are just simply repeating themselves, you have a little bit of variation, perhaps a little bit of progress as these women are, are, are giving way to you know the next woman in the generations. But so we have Alba at the end here who has suffered crazy things. Things. She is also someone who really um, was very close to the patriarchy. So in some ways, the patriarch, in some ways, you know, she was very much favored by Esteban Trueba, and he sort of only lived for her toward the end of his life. So you have this idea here of, of someone who of someone who is really like kind of endorsed by the patriarchy, which is important. But you also have someone who is creating both the book that you're holding in your hands, but also the next generation. And again, we do not know if this next generation is going to be a child. We don't know if it's a boy or a girl, which is important. Um, you kind of think it's going to be a girl simply because of the matriarchy, but also like, who knows? I mean, obviously nobody knows. Maybe Allende. I'm sure she had a sense maybe of, of which it was going to be. I God, I hope it's not Eva Luna. I loved Eva Luna. What if there's like a sequel to this and I didn't even know it? Oh my God. Someone leave that in the comments for me. Actually, I'll go check that out later. But we have this idea of her being creative in this way. And we don't know if this child is a product of the left or of the right. And to her, it does not matter because it is in fact her child. So you have this sense of, of uh, instead of a family, you know, sort of evaporating and disappearing and being eaten up um, by, by the natural landscape and, and by their own uh, issues in the jungle, you in fact have a family that is going to continue and one that has surmounted incredible difficulties of all of the women in the novel. I mean, they all are, are suffering different things, but certainly Alba with like the terrible torture that she endures is showing just absolutely incredible strength and resilience. And not only that, but she is in fact procreating. She is strong enough and well enough. Um, and you know, she's she's gonna have this baby, but she also is, is very sanguine and very upbeat at the end of the novel about the importance of repeating her uh, or, or recording what her grandmother has written. So I'm gonna treat you to the last paragraph here. Mi abuela escribió durante 50 años en sus cuadernos de anotar la vida. Escamoteados por algunos espíritus cómplices, se salvaron milagrosamente de la pira infame donde perecieron tantos otros papeles de la familia. Los tengo aquí a mis pies, atados con cintas de colores separados por acontecimientos y no por orden cronológico, tal como ella los dejó antes de irse. Clara los escribió para que me servirían ahora para rescatar las cosas del pasado y sobrevivir a mi propio espanto. El primero es un cuaderno escolar de 20 hojas escrito con una delicada caligrafía infantil. Comienza así. Barrabás llegó a la familia por vía marítima. So, I mean, a couple of things. Again, I'm not sure that we needed the first sentence here. I did like the fact that we have some verbatim repetition here. Um, you know, we have the idea of the delicada calligrafía infantil. We have the idea of um, the idea of these things as being uh, so that she could rescatar las cosas del pasado y sobrevivir a mi propio espanto. So you have repetition of things that, you know, if you're a careful reader, um, which, I mean, honestly, are you going to remember? Gosh, it's only 411 uh, pages, this book. But if you're on the YouTube, I'm going to show you the font. Check out this font. It's like, it's teeny. It's teeny tiny. Also, you note that um, there's not a lot of paragraphs here. I mean, it's really, in some ways, a very, very dense text. But at the end, we have this nice kind of echo of what was happening at the beginning. We certainly have things coming full circle. And we have some also some nods to the fact that the book is very asynchronous. We have this idea that, you know, the, the, all of these things are sort of um, piled up together. It's not linear, which speaks to the fact that, you know, it, this is a family that is going to repeat itself. It's a family where the spirits, you know, the presences of dead people are, are often felt by living people. It's, it, it's very, um, at the end here, we have this very nice nod to lots of the ways that the novel functions. So I hope that you enjoyed this deep dive into these two absolute masterpieces of literature. I mean, I was going to say of South American literature or like magic realist literature, but the fact is they're, they're just, um, they're incredibly innovative, incredibly important, and just absolutely engaging and really beautiful and very smart and very entertaining pieces of literature. So I feel a little silly that I did not understand the many, many ways in which the House of the Spirits was speaking, was in dialogue with a hundred years of solitude. I mean, in retrospect, that's also partly because I read the House of the Spirits in 1985 when I was in high school. 
and I didn't read A Hundred Years of Solitude until, you know, many years later. Again, I, I went for like the, the, the chick book. I went for like the woman's book. Um, I wasn't really that interested in, a, you know, a book that felt very much like a dude book to me. So I kind of in some ways read them in the wrong order, meaning I read the later novel first and didn't obviously recognize that it was in conversation with an earlier novel. But I can tell you it was so excellent to be hearing all of these echoes and just understanding the many ways in which this genre of literature is so telling and so important and, and, and all of the very, very cool ways in which Allende is building on and pushing against the work of Garcia Marquez. So thank you so much for tuning in. Um, you know, those of you who are, are uh, you know, brushing off the Spanish, it's, is it easy? These are not necessarily the easiest books because, in fact, a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the detail here gets a little bit specific. But, um, you know, throw it on your Audible and then just, like, maybe listen to it at a little slower, a little slower than, than 1.0 speed and, and just enjoy. They're just incredible works. And I really appreciate you taking the time, in fact, to listen to this. So... Happy reading.